So welcome everybody. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Peter, uh, Aaron Peters Burton uh, today to give us this public uh, seminar in the Department of Education at Oxford. Um, her talk is gonna be about epistemic network analysis and how it uh, exposes understanding of um, how groups think um, before we get going, I want to sort of provide a, a brief uh, background on Erin's uh, professional background. Uh, so uh, Professor Erin Peters Burton is the Director of Center for Social Equity through Science Education at George Mason University in the USA. And this is an academic center that conducts research and philanthropy related to science and STEM education. Her research agenda is based on social justice and she, she pursues projects that help students who feel excluded in science classes become more aware of the scientific enterprise and how scientific knowledge is generated. She is interested in the nexus of the nature of science, science teacher pedagogical content knowledge and educational psychology. She has been uh, the uh, co-investigator and principal investigator of several projects uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in the USA, um, including the Fostering Student Computational Thinking with Self-Regulated Learning project, uh, which uh, helped develop electronic notebooks for uh, students to computationally self-regulate. Um, there are a lot of uh, things that I can talk about uh, Erin here, actually. I'm just picking some of the highlights um, that I think are relevant to our audience here. Uh, but uh, she's also an editor of the STEM Roadmap series published by the NSTA Press. Um, she has background in engineering and she's been a secondary school teacher for 15 years. And uh, obviously these experiences shape her uh, wealth of knowledge and, and understanding of science education and engineering education. She's received several state and national awards for work in secondary science education and holds a national board certification in early adolescent science. In 2005, uh, she was selected as an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow for NASA where she advised the agency in their development of curriculum for teachers across the US. Her work at NASA led her to be chosen as a member of the committee, de developing the first K through 12 national engineering standards. So again, I, I mean, I have a whole lot of other things I could cite from her CV. So it's a really great pleasure for us to be welcoming you, Erin, here today. I should also mention that Erin um, has received an Aster Fellowship uh, to, uh, to come to our department uh, before the pandemic began, which wasn't possible for obvious reasons. Uh, so we're really delighted to have you uh, here today. Um, Erin, to, to talk about your research on epistemic network analysis, which I think will be very relevant for a lot of people in the department. So welcome to you all and welcome everybody. So uh, can I just ask that uh, you keep your cameras and your uh, microphones off uh, during the talk? And once we finish the talk, um, we, not me, we, this is Erin who is pretending. <laughs> you can join in if you'd like. <laughs> really. So once Erin finishes the talk, uh, we are going to stop the recording and, um, and then you can turn on your cameras and microphones. Uh, this is for data protection and privacy reasons. Um, please do not turn on your cameras and uh, um, microphones until um, I, I tell you to do so at the end, but if you're welcome to put in any comments in the chat line, if you have any comments or questions as we go along. So over to you, Erin, thank you very much again for joining. We look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Erdogan. I am so thrilled. I feel so fortunate to be sponsored uh, by Sibel for this talk. And I'm very fortunate that you're all here to join me. I'm really looking forward to any kind of comments or feedback you might have. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and these slides are available um, in whatever form you might want to share, uh, and uh, very happy to take any kind of questions or things like that in the chat. Um, I'll talk for about 30 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So thanks for that great introduction. All right, so we're going to take a look at uh, ways to understand how groups think using epistemic network analysis. 
And my agenda today is first to discuss how this measurement technique was developed, just generally what it is, so you can understand some of the results that I'm going to share with you. And the results come from a diversity of application, which I think is one of the uh, benefits of this type of method, uh, the methodology. And then uh, I will go through pretty specific techniques for how to do it. So if you decide you want to dive in and try it out, um, this, it'll be enough for you to dip your toe in the water. And I'm happy to assist you outside of this talk as well. And then we'll talk about limitations and things that we still need to look at. So uh, first, you know, why, why epistemic network analysis? Why do we need this? So um, I, as uh, Sibel has mentioned, uh, part of my work is in the uh, field of nature of science. And so uh, when I started out in the mid 2000s, uh, the nature of science measures were uh, very unidimensional. And so, um, uh, I went to look back and see what the pro, you're like, what's the progress of everything. So back in the 1960s, nature of science assessments, so this is epistemic understandings in science, they were mainly quantitative. So first choice, uh, the researchers came up with the terms, and then the participants answered them. Um, and around the 1990s, many of the researchers in the field made the argument that if we are truly to, to measure what people understand, we need to get their verbatim statements. We need to get the information directly from them, which I think is a pretty solid argument. So since about the mid 1900s, almost all of the nature of science articles that include a measure of either student or teacher understanding of the nature of science um, has been through the VNOS, which is, um, whichever version you choose between uh, seven and 14 open-ended questions. And some of the questions are, um, what is the difference between science and art? So you can see wide open. There is a rubric uh, to measure, to, you know, to um, analyze the results. Um, so that has, has made it a bit less cumbersome instead of open coding it, but um, it still remains to be a, a measure that teachers can't really use unless they really have an extensive knowledge in the nature of science and in qualitative coding. So, so the benefits of using the VNOS uh, is that the statement does come from the participants. So you get their true views, not a forced view and sort of a guess. Um, you can analyze the quality of the statement, the way they put the words together in order to understand that. So that's great benefits of it. But the drawbacks of the VNOS is that you can only measure individuals. So if you're looking at trying to understand a group's uh, understanding of the nature of science, you have to kind of take a really broad brush um, from what each individual says. Uh, you can try to put it into uh, a quantitative, uh, like a scoring guide, but it isn't really, um, it doesn't really assist much other than putting a number instead of a word for the level of, of proficiency. Um, and so with the VNOS, you can only bin statements. You can only put them into uh, developing, emerging, sophisticated, you know, so however you slice it up, you can only put statements into categories rather than looking across statements for connections. So that's what the epistemic network analysis does. It helps connect statements um, for a group and you can actually measure a whole group and see it in, in one view, much like an average, which is what you do a lot in education. So um, on the left of this slide is the resulting network map of an epistemic network analysis. Um, the red is some of the interpretation of the map. So what you get with a map are the black dots, which are nodes, and those are the ideas. And the um, lines or, or edges, as they call it in epistemic network analysis, because they have to have very technical language, um, the edges connect those ideas. So it shows direct connection between those ideas. So I'll show you later in some of the other results how uh, you, can, you can determine um, growth or differences using this visual. Um, but what it really is, is a, it's a conversion mixed methods technique where uh, you take verbatim statements from your participants and you open code them. Each fragmented code uh, goes on a card 
It could be a physical card. It could be an electronic card. I'm going to show you some of the electronic tools later on in the talk. Um, and you take these cards, you give them back to your participants, and you ask them to sort the cards into groups that make meaning for them. Um, it, this was originally from, derived from social network analysis, whereas social network analysis, you could take a company's emails, for example, and each person would be a node, and then whoever emails another person would be the edge or the line on the network map. Um, so when I heard about social network analysis, I thought, well, huh, I wonder if you could do this with ideas. And we gave it a couple tries and lo and behold, here I am, yes, you could. <laughs> so um, what you do is you can ask your participants qualitative open-ended statements, much like the VNOS, um, or you know, other questions that you might generate about the topic. Um, give them open-ended questions, have them free write about it, code, code the statements, put them on cards, have them uh, put cards into piles of meaning, and then you use uh, unit matrices to connect them. So I'll get into all the technical stuff later on. But I did want you to, to, to get an overview of what it is, wh where is this coming from? Where is this map coming from? So the resulting map um, gives you uh, the, the, the top three quarters of pairing frequencies. So if um, participant A puts together card five and card seven, and participant B puts together card five and card seven, then that has a higher frequency than if only one of them did it. And the higher the frequencies, the more central they become in the map the closer they become in their clusters. And as you can see here, the red circles are the clusters. Um, and um, the distance between each idea is actually quantifiable. So uh, it gives us quite a bit of things to investigate. You can investigate the density of the edges at any particular area. You could summarize the density of the edges for the whole map. Um, you can look at uh, jumps, which is one node to another node to another node. So if you have two ideas that you're interested in connecting, you can see how your participants uh, connect it. If, do they connect it directly or do they connect it through another idea? So I have some examples to show you here. Um, uh, so, um, oh, I, I'm sorry. I put on this slide because I forgot to mention um, the distance between nodes visually represents the connection between the ideas. So uh, MDS is multidimensional scaling. We'll also talk about that a little bit later. But when you use multidimensional scaling, it takes the inverse of the frequency. And so it creates a shorter distance between the highly frequent, frequently paired ideas. And so that's great on these maps because you can quickly visually see that there are really two groups of ideas on this map. And then you can go and investigate statements and try to figure out what do those groups really mean and the really highly connected ideas, um, like where are those things happening? There are other dimensions that you can use on this map too. So to review, we have distance between nodes, uh, clusters, density of the edges, um, but you can also qualitatively go in and um, judge the, the quality of a statement. So for this map that you're looking at right now, um, the larger the node, the more sophisticated the idea. And then the color of the node represents a particular group in the nature of science framework. So all of the greenish nodes are all in this, all considered in the same category. And all the pink nodes are all considered in, this, in a different category. But as you can see, they're clustering together. So that's good. That means People are learning things and connecting ideas that were meant to be connected. So I'm going to walk through a few of these maps. So uh, this was the proof of concept paper that we did. Um, uh, Liz Baynard, who was my GRA, uh, I burnt the poor, <laughs> poor girl out because we had to do everything by hand. Um, so we tallied all of the matrices by hand. We literally gave the participants index cards. So we had to we had code all the statements, put them on physically on cards, run, you know, run them out to the participants and uh, have them sort. So it was quite labor intensive. So um, luckily there's been a, quite a few electronic 
systems that have been developed that we, we can use now that shortcuts a lot of that heavy work. So this proof of concept um, was that the question was, if we asked four questions, two about the nature of knowledge, two about the nature of knowing in the content area of science, and we gave it to seventh and eighth grade students, which are 13, 14 year olds, uh, teachers of seventh and eighth grade students and scientists, would we get different maps? So then if that were true, we could continue on and, and use this measurement technique uh, as, as a way to measure distance or differences or potentially growth. So, so as you can see here, um, the students had quite a complex map um, it's very dense, which is a good sign. That means there are lots of ideas kind of going around. And um, the group piece of this is, if you remember, it's the first three quarters of a quartiles of frequencies. So that means, you know, it takes the, takes the, the top 75% of paired ideas. So if a, a group has more consistency of the, what they believe to be true or believe to be the idea, you'll get a denser map. Um, and if they have a lot of ideas in it. So, um, so the, you can see the students have really dense ideas. You can see how they're clustered. So in the top left corner, in the, in the bottom right, or the bottom left corner, the bottom right corner, and then there's three ideas in the top right corner that are somewhat connected, but as you can see, their distance is, is further apart. So you could take a look at those clusters and try to make sense of what the statements mean and look back at how the students categorize those piles that they put together of the cards and you could interpret the map that way. So students had ideas about experimentation and where scientists get their ideas um, within their map. Um, you may be wondering why the teacher's map is a bit thin compared to the student map. Um, and this was a, a really interesting thing here in Virginia in the United States, we have um, standardized tests and that at eighth grade. Um, so these teachers um, have to get students ready for a test of three years of material. And so these are teachers who are very focused on what's on the test. And there are nine nodes on this uh, map. And if you look at our standards, there are exactly nine standards about the nature of science in Virginia. So the good news about this map is that teachers were on point with what they needed to get the students ready for for the test, but unfortunately that was really all they were concerned with. So, as, so this technique gave us an idea of, okay, this group really needs some more uh, diversification in their nature of science knowledge. And then scientists, um, it looks like a flower. It was amazing when we got when we got these results. Um, in in the center, there were actually four very tightly connected ideas about statistical significance, reliable resources, reproducibility, and transparency, uh, which are, seem to be core ideas in science. And then in the different ra radii, um, we had different interpretations. So, so this is what multidimensional scaling gets you, um, is that it converts the distance, the highly frequently, um, the high frequency connections into short, short distances. And so, um, so our next uh, study was um, using it as a pre-post test. And so, um, so here you could see how it's sort of clustered. Um, this was the pretest. You can see there are some pretty densely clustered ideas in the center about tentativeness of science. Um, empirical evidence seemed to be highly clustered too. And then there were some, some scattered ideas about habits of mind. Um, and then after this uh, one semester, this, um, by the way, this is uh, also 13 and 14 year olds. I, have, I was an eighth grade teacher, so I happen to have the attention of quite a few 13 and 14 year olds for these studies. Um, so uh, as you can see in the post test, and this is very uh, encouraging so that um, the ideas shifted a bit, but they're definitely denser. So there's more ideas, they're more tightly connected. And if you think about the group putting these ideas together, it means that this whole group of 40 students agreed on these ideas and agreed so much they were very, very close. 
so um, this was very encouraging that you know there's outcome uh, the you could you could read the connectedness you could read the quality of the statements and then even the sort of scattered ideas even though um, you know they're not quite as tightly clustered they're definitely closer than in the pretest map. So this was a way to use epistemic network analysis in a slightly different way. Um, this was over time to look at shifts of ideas over time. And so we asked, this was the um, uh, Letterman slash McComas framework of nature of science, um, where there were five to nine ideas about nature of science. So as pre-service teachers, uh, we did a map of just those ideas. So we asked them very few questions. Um, and so that has less nodes on it but um, the position of the nodes was very important in this study. And then they taught, they left, they graduated, they, they found jobs, they taught for five years and we went back to them, 23 teachers. And um, we were able to see how their ideas had changed given uh, the, the practical work and then being immersed in their job and trying to get students prepared for the next level. Um, and so, what we could do potentially with this is since it's a distance formula that's creating the distance between one and another, if we had an ideal map that we could project, say 10 or 15 years in the future, we could look at the distance changes because these are the same ideas on the map. That was, that was the point of this map is that we asked them about these, these ideas and you know, specifically how important are they rank them. So um, you could you could find the distance change on from from year one to year five, and then potentially map it year ten and year fifteen. So you could just extrapolate it um, and see what that map looks like, and then we could potentially make changes in our pre-service teacher program. Um, so this was the most um, dimensional analysis that we did. Um, so we now that we had a kind of a footing for epistemic network analysis, and I say we because I've had lots of partners along the way. Um, and so uh, we took the VNOS and we asked the question, could we potentially extend it? So we know we could get um, the ideas of VNOS will bin. Uh, you can get the different categories of ideas and the quality in those different categories for individuals. But would it work with a group? And so um, we did a study with uh, uh, pre-service teachers who were taking a nature of science course, so a 16-week course at a college level, graduate level, and um, asked them the questions on the VNOS, uh, pre-course and post-course. And uh, we were able to, because the VNOS had a rubric, we were able to use the rubric for quality of statement. So we were able to use the nodes in another way, so we could blow out the nodes. And then also, these are the seven categories of the nature of science. And so they, we represented those in colors. So we could see here in this big uh, cluster that this was theories and laws, um, that the lots of theories and law ideas were clinging together at the very beginning. And then there were some less sophisticated ideas, <clears throat> excuse me, about um, uh, ep uh, empirical evidence um, and some other ideas there. And so then there's sort of these like multicolored things. So there's ideas about lots of different categories kind of hanging out together. But then after the course, you could see they sort of straightened out a bit and they started grouping, clustering together quite tightly. So here's the uh, revisiting of the green clusters and the pink clusters. Um, but the interesting thing that we found is that in these different clusters, there tended to be some sophisticated ideas in different areas, um, which, doesn't surprise me because they're so interconnected. These are not distinct ideas, um, but it does lead to the idea that um, there might be um, some core ideas that need to develop in order to bring ideas from another category together. And I don't think we would have been able to get that with just the VNOS. And so um, this was yet another way we used epistemic network analysis. Um, so you might recognize this student map from the very first proof of concept study. And we looked at it through the Letterman slash McComas model of nature of science. And so we were able to identify some clusters about subjectivity, objectivity, tentativeness, creativity, and then some clusters that didn't really uh, 
meet any of the criteria for the categories in that framework. Um, and so we would take another framework you might be familiar with, with the uh, family resemblance approach, the FRA. Um, and then um, we use the FRA. And although this is the scientist model, we did it with the students and the teachers and the scientists. And um, we actually uh, were able to pull out more detail from the maps using a different model. So what does this say about epistemic network analysis? Well, if you use the questions, the open-ended questions at the beginning that are um, you know, framework free in a way, we asked the dimensions of nature of knowledge and nature of knowing from Hoffer and Pintridge. So that was discipline free. We added the discipline into it. So we weren't trying to replicate any ideas from any models. We just wanted to see generally what students, teachers, and scientists thought about the nature of knowing in science. So what's, what's it look like to a scientist? What's the world look like to a scientist? And the nature of knowledge. So how do scientists get that knowledge? And so being able to um, look at it through lots of different lenses is something that this measure doesn't really have, um, I would say, like a theoretical background. You could use it in any content area as long as you have questions that are open-ended that will generate ideas that will represent the ideas you're trying to represent from the map. Um, so in a way, that is a, that's a validity test, is that if you ask the right questions, will you get the answers you were intending? So this is the last one that um, I will show you. And um, this is brand new. We're still preparing this manuscript. And so um, this is for the um, IB organization, the International Baccalaureate. And um, they asked us to do a document analysis of all of their uh, portals and um, looking through the lens of collaboration in science. And so what, does, what directions are we giving our teachers, our students about collaboration in science? So we came up with a theoretical model and then we tested the model with this. So really all this took was um, coding of documents and then we needed to see where co-occurrence of coding happened. So anytime you can pair things together, you can create an epistemic network analysis. So when we coded this, we coded very broadly uh, we've coded all the documents very broadly and then um, looked within that code to see if there were two or three or more ideas um, in our code book. And so when we did, we were able to place them on the map. Um, and so we were able to generate this map to show uh, IB organization that in their documentation, they are really doing a great job explaining socially shared self-regulated learning, the role of the students, problem solving and task structure. And then there's some strong ideas together about student knowledge of the learning process and cognitive engagement. Um, there's a cluster here, um, but if they, they can now look at this map and say, okay, we probably aren't doing as good of a job explaining what group size means and the rationale for group size. Um, so they can add that to their documentation that way. I have also recently seen epistemic network analysis done with a survey. Um, where the survey participants were asked um, to create ideas about a particular problem. Uh, and then uh, they realized that all they could do was much like the nature of science, bin them into different categories. And so they sent back the ideas in the survey and asked people to connect them, which ones go together. And then they were able to create a network analysis map from that, which was great. Okay, so um, Sibella, is there, do I, do I need to take a, a breath and answer questions before I go into the technique that gets quite technical? Um, I, I don't see any uh, questions in the chat, so. All right, yeah. I, will, <laughs> I will march through it. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> All right, everybody, put on your seatbelts. Um, so um, so uh, I put the procedures in this slide. I had talked about them before, um, but now you can see, you know, in, in visually, um, you determine your questions for the participants, make sure that they are free write. Um, and then you open code statements. Uh, you can do iterator reliability on those open codes. 
And then uh, I'll show you an example of condensing statements. Um, there's a bit of a trickiness with condensing statements because the idea is that this technique gives you the verbatim statements from the participants. Um, so if you condense them, now you are changing the words before you give them the cards back um, to sort. So, um, so you have to be careful about that and explain your process uh, if needed. Um, then uh, you give all of these statements back to that particular group. So in the case of the very first study we did that had students, teachers, and scientists in separate groups, we took the ideas from the students and gave them, gave those cards back to only the students. We took the ideas from the teachers, gave them back to only the teachers, and took the ideas from the scientists and gave them back only to the scientists. So you don't try to cross groups. Um, you already have a bit of um, explaining to do by teaching. So by teaching people in the group that might not have come up with many statements, now you're giving them back statements from other people in the group um, where they need to sort of justify those. Um, the one way we've gotten around it is that when we give back the cards, and when I say cards, they could be electronic cards. Um, when you give back the cards to the group, you ask them to set aside any cards they don't understand and set aside any cards they don't agree with. So then that way we really truly are getting the connections in the network model um, that they really agree upon and not just trying to put a card in because you have to sort all the cards. Um, so that, that has been quite successful for us. Okay, so you give the, the group back the cards, um, they put them into cards to make meaning for them. We've asked, uh, we've done it both ways where we just said, put them into groups and we'll figure out the meaning based on the statements. Um, but we've also asked people to, to write the idea for the groups, and um, that is a mixed bag. It comes, people name lots of different things, lots of, <laughs> lots of different things. So we ended up having to interpret that anyway. So we didn't get much leverage with that. Um, so when the cards are put together, each person represents a unit matrix. Um, and I have a graphic for this. But um, if, card, if that one person puts card five and card seven together, there's a one in that cell of that spreadsheet and a zero everywhere else until you place all the cards in there. Then once you have these unit matrices that have either a one or a zero in all of the cells, then you add them up across the group. Um, and this compiled matrix then gets put into the UCI net software uh, or there's lots of other choices you can make. I, I prefer UCI net. Um, and you get your network model visualization and you can you know, move it around with MDS or you can leave it as is. Um, it doesn't give you quite as intense um, uh, interpretation if you don't scale it with multidimensional scaling. So this is what the unit matrices look like. Um, so uh, you'll notice that uh, this diagonal has to be a one all the way through. Uh, because it's the same card. It's card one and card one, card two and card two, card three and card three. So, but this is a, a, a unit matrix of a participant who placed cards one, three, and five together in a pile. So here's the column for card three. And as you can see, card one, three, and five are in the pile. So this is what the translation mathematically looks like. And then you just take all the matrices and you add them up. And the most commonly paired uh, cards, which represent are now represented by a number in a cell, if they are the most highly paired ones, they would have the highest numbers. And when you invert that number, then you get close connections between those two nodes. So it does that. What this this method does is it allows for participant voice to come through because they are in cards. Um, you get to it's a conversion method. So uh, you get to summarize things that quantitative, you know, the, the affordances that quantitative gives you, but still keeping the quality of the statement. Um, you, the maps are pretty easy to visualize, you know, to um, interpret visually. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't have to have highly skilled um, ideas to interpret the maps. You might need a bit of education to do the maps, but if you're given the map, you can probably interpret them. So if you give maps to teachers, they could most likely interpret them. 
Um, and you have um, centrality, clusters, density, and jumps that you can measure. So there's multiple different measures you can have. And then if you do a little extra work, you can interpret the quality of the statement and change the node color and size to represent those dimensions as well. So here's uh, an example of condensing a statement. Um, so if we had in this one study, we had 30 participants and they each came up with 30 statements. We had 900 statements and you do not want people to put 900 cards together. They won't finish it. So uh, you try to get it between 30 and 50 cards. That's a pretty manageable number. Um, and so these are some of the ideas that we condensed into a, into a new idea. And so this takes a team to agree upon, um, but it's nothing much more than iterator reliability. And this is a screenshot of Proven by Users, which is a free software um, that we use uh, in, in my classes. I teach nature science course and we often, I, I do assessments this way because it's easier to see what the, how the group is moving. Um, and this is what it looks like to sort ideas into bins, uh, so that into the piles, sorry. So that you can name the piles and then these are the ideas and they drop and drag. So they, they end up, you know, they're, they're all over here from our card list and then you drop and drag them into a bin and you name the bin. Aska Pesca, as they say in Irish. Um, this is the output of it. Um, and so you, here's your matrix where you can see these zeros here is that the idea of the scientific questions asked, uh, blah, 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 and science is a unique way of knowing are not usually paired together. So you can get a quick view. They actually heat map it. So you can really see where your big nodes are, or your, the central, the nodes will show up centrally when you do multidimensional scaling. So you can eyeball it, it's quite nice. Um, and then uh, you can export the data into Excel. What you do have to do for some of the software is make it symmetric, you know, so um, just like a correlation table, you've got to, you've got to flip it and copy it and flip it. And then um, UCI net is very simple, also free, and it looks like this, you can upload your file into it, do some machinations to get the ideas that you want to get. Uh, make sure you do multidimensional scaling so you can get your centrality measures and you get the inverse distances and then you get your map and you can interpret it visually through centrality clusters distance between nodes you can calculate line at line density and you can calculate um, let's say 2c over here and uh, 14m there is a calculation where it'll tell you how many ideas are in between these two ideas so you can go back and look at the qualitative um, version of it and um, see what ideas are connecting the ideas that you're interested in. So some limitations of this is that it's not precise, um, other than the density, the average density, um, the other measures are, uh, well, the distances are pretty precise, but interpretation tends to be up to researchers. Um, and in, exam in examining groups, sometimes we are ignoring some individual differences, uh, but you, we do that with uh, mean and standard deviation as well. Um, and we do need some, I, some more work on how do we consistently condense ideas? Um, are there other applications for this? And is there a way that we could really precisely cluster, maybe using hierarchical uh, cluster analysis or something like that? So thank you so much for your attention. I'm opening it up for questions or comments right now. And this is my contact information. If you want me to walk, any, walk through anything with you, I'm very happy to do that. Thank you so much.